Hello, my name is Dean Messinger, and I'm a master's student with the Division for Late Medieval and Reformation Studies. Thank you for participating in our online version of our summer lecture series. Before I begin my lecture, I would first like to provide a brief content warning and some clarification. I will be quoting from historical sources from the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries that make use of certain terms which are offensive and disparaging today, namely the terms Negro and Mulatto, as well as terms like Moreno, Pardo, and Bozales. In this lecture, I aim to place these terms in their proper historical context and explain how these terms were used by people at the time to segregate various groups of African descent peoples in the Atlantic world. Outside of source quotations, I will simply be referring to these historical people as black, encapsulating a large and diverse group of people of African origin or descent. My use of the term black confraternities then refers to confraternities where the identification of members was primarily based on their connection to descent from and origins in the continent of Africa and the outward appearance of darker skin. I will now begin my lecture. In the early 19th century, an English coffee merchant in Brazil named Henry Coster took note of a celebration hosted by the local black confraternity, Our Lady of the Rosary, in which the assembled danced, prayed, and elected and crowned from amongst their members a king of the Congo. These festivals, called Congo King celebrations, were forged in the crucible of the Atlantic world and have deep roots in the traditions of the Kingdom of Congo in Central Africa and were celebrated across the Atlantic world by black confraternities from Portugal to Patagonia and from New England to Brazil. In his observations, the Englishman noted that, quote, the Brazilian kings and queens of Congo worship Our Lady of the Rosary, and their subjects dance, it is true, after the manner of their country. But to these festivals are admitted African Negroes of other nations, Creole blacks, and mulattoes, all of whom dance after the same manner." End quote. This observation captures two important characteristics of black confraternities in the Iberian Atlantic world. First, these Congo King festivals illustrate the endurance and resilience of African traditions and cultures across the Atlantic and across centuries. Second, this observation reflects two distinct but often interwoven processes of black community and identity formation in the Atlantic world. One being a wider, inclusive, almost pan-African development, and the other processes of ethnogenesis where specific African ethnic groups formed and reformed in the new world. In the Congo King festivals, we see the persistence of cultural rituals from the Congolese peoples, as well as the inclusion of peoples descended from other African peoples. What brought these people together for, their, for celebration was the rituals and practices of the Catholic confraternities of which they were a part. In these Congo King celebrations, sometimes cooperative and sometimes competing, discourses on race, religion, and identity intersected to create a holiday that is still celebrated today across the Atlantic world. In this lecture, I will be exploring black confraternities in the Iberian Atlantic empires of Spain and Portugal, and how they helped shape historical developments of racial and ethnic identity formation among their congregations. I first discuss confraternities as a whole, their role in society, and the services they provided to their congregations before moving on to the all too important discussion of race and ethnicity, exploring their vital differences in their historical contexts. Then I will discuss the complexities of historical identity or the processes of self and other identification among African descent peoples, showing that identity is polyvalent and ever-changing sense of self and community and not a static descriptor. After this, I will explore the ways in which confraternities upheld the colonial race system, while simultaneously challenging it through their roles as ethnic societies and the preservers of African cultures. Finally, I will explain how confraternities helped forge a pan-Black Christian identity among African descent peoples in the New World that relied less on ethnicity and more on shared African influences, rituals, and social organizations, like the Congo King festivals mentioned earlier. This pan-Black identity, which was fostered in confraternities, would prove enduring and long-lasting, influencing, so, influencing social and cultural developments in the Americas for centuries. Now, to start with the confraternities. 
confraternities or associations of lay people organized for religious purposes came to define the social, cultural, and religious lives of various communities. Separated from their homes by the horror of slavery, African descent peoples face social, economic, and spatial dislocation, thus endowing confraternities with renewed importance as they could provide in some form artificial families and social security in the face of chaotic and stressful living conditions. In a new colonial setting, confraternities were transformed from their earlier medieval origins into an institution that reflected the new peoples who, con who constituted them and became an essential part of the connections, complexities, and innovations of the Atlantic world. Particularly for African and African descent peoples, confraternities became an essential institution for community building, linguistic and cultural preservation, and socioeconomic support. As we can see in this image, the confraternity of the Holy Spirit collected alms and then distributed food and clothing to prisoners on Pentecost. Confraternities hosted feasts, provided loans and financing to members, collected alms and distributed charity, and conducted processions on holy days. By allowing their members a semi-autonomous sphere of activity and expression, confraternities provided vital opportunities for racial and ethnic identity formation among free and enslaved blacks in the Atlantic world. Now it is important here to distinguish between race and ethnicity as analytical concepts and the ways in which I use them in this lecture. When I use the term race, I'm speaking of the hegemonic concept that first gained purchase during this era, as Europeans encountered diverse peoples beyond the oceans and sought ways to simplify and categorize them. Race, as opposed to ethnicity, is totalizing and general, subsuming different African cultures and ethnicities under the banner of black. It was during this period that European imperialism helped forge what historical anthropologist Irene Silverblatt has termed the signature racial triad of white, black, and Indian. Within these seemingly neat categories, colonial administrators could divide their societies, establishing different rules, policies, and restrictions for the different races. In the Iberian Atlantic, this is called the casta system, a form of racialized categorization based on descent that was quite complex even for those enacting it in the colonies and was constantly in flux. Yet it had important legal and social consequences. As we can see here in this 18th century casta painting, what racial category one was defined as was based on parentage and what fractions of black, Indian, or Iberian one was. It is important to note that these categories were not based on any real characteristics, but rather on stereotypes and pseudoscientific concerns about the purity of Iberian bloodlines. In this conceptualization, different African ethnicities like the Yoruba peoples or the Mina peoples were all simply black. As historian Matt Child says, Africans became black in the Americas. Ethnicity, on the other hand, is specific where race is general. I use the term ethnicity to refer to relatively flexible cultural linguistic groups that shared similar traditions, rituals, social structures, and geographic origins. In the historical sources, these ethnic groups are referred to as nations. As we can see in this map of West African ethno-linguistic groups, the caste system and colonial racial policies often serve to erase or silence in the official records these specific groups in favor of more generalized racial categories. Congolese, Yoruba, and Mina, for example, are cultural linguistic groups within Africa that persisted in the New World and are represented among confraternities. As we shall see, while many confraternities that served African and African descent people were simply labeled as black by colonial authorities, the bylaws and charters of the confraternities themselves often made distinctions between different African nations represented in their congregations. Confraternity records also often made note of the ethnicity of their members, allowing historians some ability to understand the diversity of African descent peoples in the New World. Creating a social space nested between the enforced colonial race system and the realities of cultural differences between the African ethnicities present within confraternities proved to be a persistent site of conflict while also providing unique opportunities for the creation of a wider black identity. The distinction between colonial race and African ethnicities reflects the complexities of identity and identification 
among historical subjects. Identities, as they are today, are rarely static and monolithic, and one may identify differently for different audiences, since self and other identification is inherently situational. I, for example, would identify myself to other Americans as living in Tucson, but when abroad, I simply say I am American. Both identities exist in cooperation, yet they have different meanings for different audiences. Historical identities were also multi-layered in that there always existed, as historian Lavro Kenchevik argues, different offers of identity available to individuals. Referring to self-identification as traditions of self-narration, Kunchevik argues and explores the different ways in which a single individual may choose to present their life to different audiences. Necessarily, not all of these competing offers of identity and traditions of self-narration were equal, differing seriously when it came to crucial issues such as the power of their appeal, the frequency of their appearance, or the types of political sponsorship they enjoyed. One identity may prove more profitable or beneficial than others, as the power of the appeal of that identity varies based on the audience. For many African descent people living in the Spanish or Portuguese empires, they would often identify themselves with an African ethnic group among other African descent peoples while using a prescriptive racial term like mulatto when dealing with colonial authorities. An illustrative example of multi-layered identification can be seen in one black confraternity's foundational petition to the King of Spain from 1568. Based in Mexico City, the assembled brothers, who claimed to represent 6,000 people, began their petition by identifying themselves as, quote, the sons of Negroes and Indians, or Negras and Spanish men, that live in this land in service of Spaniards and practicing all crafts, end quote. This narrative self-identification operates on multiple different levels, including racial, Negroes and Indians, or Negras and Spanish, political, that live in this land in service of the Spaniards, and economic, practicing all crafts. Seeking to appeal to colonial authorities, these brothers identify themselves racially using categories commonly used by the authorities, politically by demonstrating their loyalty to the Spanish Empire, and economically by stating that they are self-sufficient and productive members of their society. In this way, they are covering all their bases, so to speak, to prove that they are worthy of organizing a confraternity. Examples like this show the inefficiency and failure of race or ethnicity alone as a category to accurately analyze and describe individuals in all their complexity. Moving on, I will now discuss the ways in which black confraternities upheld, protected, and facilitated specific ethnic identities among their congregations. In spite of the fact that different ethnic groups lived in close proximity due to the, due to the design of the slave system, it is known that people tended to establish social ties with those coming from neighboring regions and with those sharing similar cultural backgrounds, which allowed for the creation and maintenance of ethnic confraternities. At the most obvious level, certain confraternities restricted membership to only members of certain African nations. The confraternity of St. Anthony in Sao Pedro, Brazil, for example, only allowed Angolan peoples and people of Angolan descent to join their brotherhood. In Havana, Cuba, different ethnic confraternities created houses of the nations, or cabildos de nación, that would welcome, help support, and provide community for newly arrived slaves from their respective cultural groups. The oldest cabildo, serving the Mandinga Zape peoples, was founded in Havana in the 1560s. These houses of the nations helped Africans in the New World remain connected to the cultures and languages of Africa and created a space for African descent peoples to practice community solidarity and cultural expression. The role black confraternities played in African language preservation would prove to be essential in the formation of hybrid or Creole languages in the Atlantic world, which introduced African terminology into European lexicons. Black confraternities which restricted membership to certain ethnicities also served to preserve African religious and cultural traditions in the new world such as certain types of dancing, traditions of oral histories and storytelling, and certain artistic techniques and motifs. In this image here, we see a funeral procession hosted by a Mozambican confraternity in Rio de Janeiro, where the members, according to the artist, said prayers and sang in their native languages. 
Perhaps most importantly, these confraternities helped preserve African religious traditions, like those of the Yoruba, which would mix and mingle with Catholicism to create new and enduring syncretic religions like Santeria and Candomblé. These syncretic religions, while considered heretical or diabolical by colonial authorities, became important sites of cultural production and identity formation for African peoples living in the New World. Candomblé, for example, is practiced by around 2 million people today across Latin America and was founded by the Black confraternity Our Lady of the Good Death in Brazil. Not all Black confraternities, however, limited membership to the certain African ethnicities. It was common, though, for inclusive Black confraternities to subdivide their membership into semi-autonomous ethnic groups. The Rosaria de los Morenos confraternity in Peru, for example, was subdivided into 11 different ethnic groups called bancos or pews in English, based off of where they sat together during mass. These bancos included the Bran, Mandinga, and Jalogo peoples, among others. These subgroups sat together at mass and in general meetings of the confraternity, organized charity within their groups, and represented their members in negotiation with the colonial government. Ethnic tensions between different African ethnicities within larger black confraternities were often commonplace, so divisions such as these helped deter conflicts between confraternity members, giving each ethnicity its own autonomous group. Ethnic tensions, however, were not always mitigated, as seen by the breakup of the confraternity of San Francisco in Lima, Peru in 1593, when the Angolan and Congolese members left and formed their own confraternities. Examples such as these illustrate that despite being classified as racially black by colonial authorities, people of African origin and descent were not a monolithic racial group, but rather a diverse collection of different African ethnicities, which continued to remain significant and connected to their homelands in spite of the trauma of enslavement. Over the centuries, however, as people born in the New World as opposed to in Africa came to dominate confraternity leadership, and intermarriage between races and ethnic groups became more common, affiliations with specific ethnicities in Africa began to wane. Correspondingly, a wider pan-Black identity began to emerge in the colonies. Confraternities were essential to the creation of this identity, as their rituals and traditions, influenced and inspired by African cultural practices, soon became one of the most common similarities between African descent peoples across the Atlantic world. It was under the auspices of the confraternity where African descent peoples could mix and mingle away from the prying eyes of their masters or employers. These confraternities provided the forum needed to create new cultures. The development and trajectory of the Congo King festi festivals I mentioned at the outset of this lecture provides a perfect case study for the development of pan-ethnic black identities. The Kingdom of Congo in Central Africa from where these festivities drew inspiration, holds a unique place in history as being a large, powerful state that voluntarily converted to Catholicism even before Columbus had sailed to the Americas. This Christian kingdom was never conquered by the Portuguese or the Spanish during this period, and their king ruled as an equal to those of Europe. It was in Congo, during the process of conversion, that a uniquely and genuinely African form of Christianity emerged not led by European missionaries, but local notables, with the king's son being appointed the first black African bishop in the history of the church. On this slide, we see a unique triple cross produced in the Congo from the 16th century, and a European depiction of the Congolese king with European-style regalia. Here in the Congo, new Christian traditions emerged that would have a large impact on black Christianity around the Atlantic, as the slave trade forced Christian Africans across the ocean. Congo Christianity, as it would become known, would serve as a powerful unifying and inspirational force in black devotional practices in the new world. Because of Congo's unique place in the history of colonialism and global Christianity, Africans in the new world often looked upon the Congo favorably, drawing inspiration for their own traditions from Congo Christianity. In the Congo King celebration, confraternities would vote among their members to elect a king and queen to celebrate their connection to the powerful Christian monarchy in Africa 
and empower their members with feelings of socio-political independence. In this image, we see an artistic depiction of the king and queen of the confraternity of Our Lady of the Rosary in Rio de Janeiro. While this tradition began among Congolese confraternities, they would later spread to other ethnic confraternities, with each confraternity crowning their own kings and queens. In Lisbon, Portugal, black confraternities crowned Congo kings, Mina kings, and Angolan kings. In Brazil, it was common to also see Mandinga kings and kings of the Banguelas. As we saw in the opening vignette of this lecture, however, Congo king celebrations soon became the norm, even among groups of different ethnicities. In fact, by the 18th and 19th centuries, this transformation was largely complete, with the coronation of all black kings falling under the ceremonial title of Kings and Queens of Congo. Historian Marina de Melo Isuza explains how this process corresponded to the consolidation of a black Catholic identity that diluted original ethnic identities and helped to form a larger pan-African one with Congo Christianity at its heart. Regardless of whether or not a confraternity was affiliated with the Congolese directly, Congo became the mythic homeland for many African descent peoples in the Spanish and Portuguese empires. Dr. Melo Isuza argues that, quote, Congo takes the place of a broader ancestral Africa capable of granting ident identity, an identity signifying a Catholicism that had already been internalized while still on African soil. It was a sign that pointed to a still unconquered Africa. Thus, it signified an identity that, although Catholic, was fundamentally African, not European." End quote. The intersection of race, ethnicity, religion, and identity then, in the form of these Congo King celebrations, was fundamental to the transformation of Africans into African Americans, creating something original from European and African forms in the New World. At the heart of these transformations were the confraternities, which provided the creative and independent space needed for the preservation and transformation of African culture in the Americas. Thus, while confraternities upheld the colonial racial order through segregation, they also helped challenge it through the maintenance of African ethnic identities and the eventual creation of a newer pan-ethnic black Catholic identity. In conclusion, I hope I've illustrated the ways in which race, religion, and ethnicity embodied by confraternities played a role in the formation, preservation, and reformation of a black Christian identity in the Atlantic world. Confraternities helped keep Africa alive in the hearts and minds of African and African descent peoples in the new world. Acting as ethnic societies, they helped reestablish communal ties shattered by slavery and helped preserve languages and artistic forms. As organizations inspired and influenced by Congo Christianity, they ensured the survival of authentic forms of African religious culture. And finally, as hosts of Congo King celebrations, they helped empower those often at the lowest rung in society, providing them with autonomy, self-determination, and at least a temporary escape from the horrors of imperialism and slavery. Most importantly, confraternities helped facilitate the growth of a black Christian identity still present today across the globe. Thank you.